this dialogue that we've been exploring in the Gospel of John is the uh, statements, I am, I am, Jesus declaring himself in relationship, in relationship to us. I am the bread of life. We have a relationship with Jesus because he sustains our life. Two weeks ago, I gave you four words. Last week, I gave you four words. I told you then there was no quiz, so you don't have to repeat them. But I have four phrases for you today, or four ideas, and um, it's a little departure from the three-point sermon that I used to hear when I was a child. I've gone to four points. So first of all, Jesus is the bread of life, number one. Number two, we're going to explore what hunger is. What is hunger? There are people in the world so hungry that God cannot appear to them except in the form of bread. Number three, we get what we need when we give. Getting and giving. And number four, we are full when we are empty. So that's what we're going to play with today. Here we are back at the Sea of Galilee. Have you ever been to the Sea of Galilee? Yeah, so it's fairly large. I mean, it's, a, it's really a lake, because it's fresh water, I think, but it is big. And uh, the disciples go to the other side, and what's on the other side is not the Jewish population, but the Gentile population. So they're going to what we call the, the wilderness, right? They go to the other side, and that's where Jesus is today. They went to the other side looking for what? They were looking for a miracle. And they brought up the idea of manna. They were, the, the followers of Jesus are asking him, when are you going to give us a sign? We want to see something like manna from the Old Testament. And what's really kind of hard to understand is that the disciples had just seen Jesus produce all this bread out of nowhere. I mean, they're over there in, in nowhere land, and then the, the bread comes to them, and they're wondering, where's the sign? It's kind of weird, isn't it? But that's who we are as human beings. So the idea that um, the bread came out of nowhere, and Jesus just produced it, they're, they're, they're looking for the bread that fills their stomach. They're not, they, don't still, they still don't know who he is. I am. So bread out of nowhere. Well, when we look back into the Old Testament, the Israelites had learned a lesson about manna. And three of the lessons they learned was that you don't hoard it. You don't save it up. Because overnight it becomes stinky and smelly. You can't eat it the next day. So no hoarding. But God produced this manna. It's flakes on the ground. It was like bread on the ground. But you couldn't save it. So no hoarding. Number two, they learned that they should share it. That they should give it away. And number three, they learned from that that they were servants. That they were serving their God through giving people bread. Now, in John the followers of Jesus remember the manna, but they don't remember the story. I mean, they don't remember the lessons, right? They, they just think of bread as filling my stomach. It's not, they're not thinking about serving, hoarding, sharing. They're just thinking about, give me the bread. Um, but Jesus says, do not work for bread that perishes, but for the food that endures for life which the Son of Man will give you. This bread that Jesus gives is life-giving. It is what promotes life. And it isn't just fill my belly. It's serve my neighbor. Don't hoard it. Share it. Give it away. It's intended to be in relationship with your neighbor. So Jesus' word, words continue to identify manna as a gift from God, as that powerful gift. Then... The, the crowd seems to begin to understand that um, they, they say, give us the bread. Um, they, want, they want the bread. And um, give us this bread always, is the quote from John. Uh, they desire the bread. 
And they see him, they begin to see him as the one who is life-giving. And they identify, they begin to identify Jesus as the I am. I am, that is, he is identifying himself as Yahweh, as God. And they start to see that. So, question for us today is how, how is it that Jesus is the bread of life? How is it that Jesus provides life? So we're going to talk about hunger. Um, he identifies himself as the one who can satisfy hunger for eternal life. But how does that happen? Now, people in our world are either desperate for food or else they are eating the leftovers. I mean, when you think about it, people are either not filled or they're unfulfilled. So the poor say to the rich, uh, what do they say? How can you still be hungry? The poor are saying, the, the rich, let's, let, let's do it this way. The rich are saying to the poor, rich are saying to the poor, there's plenty to eat. Go out and get it. Right? The rich are saying to the poor, go find your food. Go work for it. Does that sound familiar? Go find your food. And the poor are saying to the rich, why are you so hungry? Why are you so unfulfilled? You've got everything you need. You've got bread for, bread for every day. Why are you so unfulfilled? Why are you so hungry when you've got everything? Well, we have people in authority who have everything and more that they need, and they are expressing fear that if we are not careful, someone else will get the stuff that they don't deserve. Does that sound familiar? People getting stuff that they don't really deserve. But the Christians, what do we say? What do we say as Christian people? Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Visit those who are in prison. Whose needs are not being met? They're the ones that we should attend to, right? The people who don't have what they need, let's attend to them. That is the message from Jesus. Who needs shelter? Who needs safety? Who needs love? Who is not getting the bread that they need? Well, I have to admit that many times... I'm feeling empty because I can't possibly produce what is needed in the world. It feels hopeless to me. Do you feel that way? Like, how, on the wor how in the world are we ever going to solve the problem of, of hunger? How are we going to do that? And then we have to say, where is God in all of this? Where is God when people are starving? So, um, that's a good question, isn't it? Where is God when people are starving? Back in the Old Testament, God was there giving the manna. Where is God when people are starving? So, uh, at Spirit in the Desert, Stephen Holm, Pastor Stephen Holm, writes daily devotions. And they're online, and you can go find them every day. And this is one of his devotions from last week. And I'm just going to read it because I think it's really good. There were regular prayers of thanksgiving among the Israelites for the gracious provision of the Lord during their times in the wilderness. Those psalms and songs ensured that they would never forget that they had been kept from starvation by the hand of God. And because that was true, God would surely continue to keep them safe and provide for their every need. But, Stephen says, it's also true that since then, countless millions of people in our world have starved to death because food was not available. And we wonder, where is God for such folks? Why weren't they showered with manna? Why weren't they given quails to eat? So what's our answer? The best answer is that there is enough food in the world. That's the best answer. Um, the earth continues to produce in abundance. There is lots of food out there. What's the problem? 
Distribution. How do people get what they need? Distribution is the problem, not abundance. So it's God's intention that all people, everyone, should have plenty to eat to meet their bodily needs. And some, we're still getting better. Some of us are getting better at this. And there, is, there are lots of evidence signs. There's evidence that we as a church, that Ascension and our other churches in this synod are doing this work. You've heard of Feed My Star Starving Children. You've heard of uh, Grace Lutheran. People are doing it, right? People are serving the poor with the abundance that we have. And so this is how God works in the world. God works through us. The byline of the ELCA, God's hand, who's, who's God, who are God's hands? Who are God's feet? We are. We're the hands and feet of God. We're doing the work. We're the ones called upon to be those who feed the hungry. Now, in the past three weeks, we in Arizona have had the unexpected opportunity to meet the needs of a few hundred families. Our government, currently unprepared to meet the needs of these suffering people, has asked Lutheran Social Service of the Southwest to step up to the challenge. And they came to the right place. They came to us. To ask. And so here's what Connie Phillips, the uh, CEO of um, Lutheran Social Service, said this week, just yesterday. She says, showing kindness, doing justice, and serving those in need. That's our mission at LSS of Minnesota, of, uh, excuse me, of, of the Southwest. It's hard to recall a time that this mission came to life more boldly than the Family Reunification Project. We don't know what the future holds for the families that we served. We don't know if they'll work with others or will work with other, others who have survived a similar situation. But we do know that we are part of something much greater, much bigger, that there are a lot of passionate people who care and who act, that God does use us in ways that we can never expect and hope is not lost. So here's what happened with our churches in Arizona this, this, these last three weeks. There were 75 volunteers serving 655 hours. There were 300 people who made gifts of money. There were 38 churches who hosted drives, food drives. There were 469 backpacks for children, 167 pieces of clothing, 30 cases of sport drinks, um, 699 stuffed toys, 108 hygiene kits, 678 prepared snacks. There were 1,200 meals served, 132 gift cards from us, 116 cases of water, and there were 372 people that were reunited, 178 families. That's what the Lutherans did in the last three weeks. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> so I have a story for you from Africa. I went to Africa a couple of times. And uh, I visited the hunter-gatherers in East Africa, in Tanzania. The hunter-gatherers there are called the Hadza, Hadzabi. And they are nomadic. They don't have a written language. They don't have radios. They don't have telephones. But every night, now, for 10,000 years, they've sat around a fire at night. Every night, they sit around a fire with the elders in the middle of the circle and the young people around the outside, and they tell stories. That's how they communicate with each other. So I was part of that. And I heard the chief in this tribe, Maroba, tell this story. It's a story of the indicator bird, a little brown bird that... Um, it has a little whistle, something like twitter, twitter. And if you call to this bird, the bird will come to you and it will show you where the honey is. It's a honey guide. The bird can't get the honey on its own without you, but it will take you to the honey. So you watch the Hadza climb the baobab tree, 
with a smudge, and they put the smudge in the hive to force the bees out, and then they pull out the honey, and it's dripping down their arm. Who gets the first honey? The bird. So you feed the bird first, and then the bird will lead you to more honey. If you don't feed him, he won't. So it's a communication with the bird. So the Hadza depend on honey to live. It's their food. They eat honey, they eat berries, they eat roots out of the ground, and once in a while they'll eat meat if they have to shoot an animal for its hide. But mostly they need the honey for their nourishment. So they always tell this story. They've been telling this particular story for 10,000 years. What is the moral of the story? What is the moral of the story? Why would they tell this story over and over again for 10,000 years? You get what you give. Right? Getting what you need in life depends on, above all, giving it back. Getting and giving. So, getting versus giving. We get in life what we give away. It's just an axiom. It's the way life works. That's why we have neighbors. That's why we have our church. That's why we have each other. Getting what really matters in life depends on giving it back. So, when we are feasting at Christ's table today, it is his own life that was poured out for us that becomes our bread. It is in the giving of himself that he is most alive even when he dies. He gave it up for us. He gave his life. And that's what's happening here today at this table. We receive Christ's body and blood. And that's life-giving. We are only filled full when we empty ourselves. And our model is Christ Jesus himself. He emptied himself to give us life. So it's not what we put in our stomachs, but rather how Jesus teaches us to live, giving to have life. So there's a, a wonderful hymn. I was going to sing it for you, and I told Dale I'm not going to sing it, but I'll, I'll speak it. And uh, my good friend Ray McKeever wrote it quite a few years ago. It's called The Hungry Feast. We come to the hungry feast, hungry for a world word of peace. To hungry hearts unsatisfied, the love of God is not denied. We come, we come to the hungry feast. We come to the hungry feast, hungry for a world released from hungry folk of every kind, the poor in body, poor in mind. We come, we come to the hungry feast. We come to the hungry feast, hungry that hunger will cease, and knowing, though we eat our fill, that the hunger will stay with us still. We come, we come to the hungry feast. The hungry feast. You're invited to the hungry feast today. The hunger that Jesus satisfies for purpose and meaning is beyond ourselves. Awakens in us a hunger for peace, for justice, and for loving kindness. As we leave the table today, we should be filled with the hunger for loving kindness. We should be hungry for peace in the world. We should be hungry for those things that others are deprived of that give life. That is why that we gather the offering at the time of the meal. We're giving ourselves to our neighbors as we receive the body and blood of Christ. And I'm sorry, last week I forgot the offering. Today we'll do it. 
and thank you for whoever picked up the pieces last week. Christ shapes our life into his own body for the world. We become bread like his bread. All of this is not by getting something, but by giving everything as Christ has given to us. Come hungry for life. Leave hungry to give life, full of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Let us pray together. Jesus Christ, you are the bread of the world. You who satisfy every need. We ask you to help us pray for others and to spread your life for the sake of others as you have given your life to us. The true meaning of broken bread and poured out wine is that we have life from you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.